In each of these lawsuits, and the accompanying ex parte motions for early discovery, Hans Meyer and Steele concealed from the court that they uploaded the client's movies to BitTorrent websites, that they filmed their own pornographic movies in order to upload them to BitTorrent websites, that they owned and controlled the plaintiffs, and thus had a significant personal stake in the litigation. Hello everyone, I am Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney, and for our first story this week, we have a really really good one. This is the United States of America v. Paul R. Hansmeyer. Yay! We got him, guys! We got him! Woo! Woo! Paul Hansmeyer, guys! Got him! Great job. What? You don't know who Paul Hansmeyer is? How can you not know who John Steele and Paul Duffy and Paul Hansmeyer are, especially if you follow this channel and watch my videos. I'm disappointed in all of you. No, I'm kidding with you. I'm kidding with you. We have last covered this story maybe a year ago, um, and we've definitely talked about the perpetrators of the Prenda Law extortion scheme. And we've covered pretty much this exact story before, but I really want to cover it one more time for final effect, for the full effect of having guilty pleas from John Steele and Paul Hansmeyer and, well, I'm not going to celebrate the death of Paul Duffy, but he did it to himself. I mean, there's, there's only so much alcohol a body can take. And then your heart gives out. It's, I'm sorry, that's just something that you do. And people who extort money from other people, frankly, should be stressed out about it. It, I, it should not be a rewarding thing that, that begets you long life and good health. So John Steele and Paul Hansmeyer and Paul Duffy were part of this extortion scheme. And they got caught and they got charged. And along the way, Paul Duffy died. And instead of explaining it any further, we're going to go over the eight pages of this report and the four pages of sentencing guidelines we'll sort of just skim through. This is the plea agreement and sentencing stipulations, which is another way of saying agreement, for Paul R. Hansmeyer in United States of America, versus Paul R. Hansmeyer. The United States of America and Paul R. Hansmeyer, here and after referred to as defendant, agree to resolve this case on the terms and conditions that follow. This plea agreement binds only the defendant and the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Minnesota and the U.S. Department of Justice Computer Crimes and Intellectual Property Section. This agreement does not bind any other U.S. Attorney's Office or any other federal or state agency. The defendant agrees to plead guilty to count one of the indictment charging him with conspiracy to commit mail fraud and wire fraud in violation of 18 U.S.C. 1349 and count 17 charging him with conspiracy to commit money laundering in violation of 18 U.S.C. 1956-H. If at the time of sentencing the defendant has complied with the terms of this agreement, any remaining counts will be dismissed in return for his plea of guilty to count 1 and count 17 of the indictment, the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Minnesota agrees not to charge the defendant with the other crimes known to it as of the date of the defendant's Rule 11 hearing, including conduct associated with the defendant's bankruptcy proceedings. Pursuant to Rule 11A2, the parties agree the defendant is entering a guilty plea conditionally, that the defendant receives the right to appeal the district court's denial of the motion to dismiss, if the defendant prevails on appeal, he reserves the right to withdraw his plea of guilty. In that event, any counts dismissed pursuant to this plea agreement will be reinstated, and the defendant waives any statute of limitations arguments regarding any such counts. As to all other pretrial motions filed by the defendant, the defendant knowingly, willfully, and voluntarily agrees to withdraw such motions. So, just in case you didn't follow that paragraph, this paragraph is saying that Paul Hansmeyer is still appealing the district court's denial of his motion to dismiss. If he prevails, he reserves the right to withdraw his plea of guilty and proceed with the case. If the motion to dismiss is not granted or granted in part, the 
uh, if it's granted in part, the, the charges will be reinstated. If it is not granted, meaning the case is not dismissed, then this is moot and the defendant waives all other motions and this plea agreement will become the operative agreement. Subject to paragraph two, the defendant admits the following facts. The defendant lacks knowledge. Where the defendant lacks knowledge, the defendant acknowledges that the government has sufficient evidence to prove beyond a reasonable doubt the following facts, all of which constitute the factual basis for this plea. Buckle up, everybody. Here we go. Beginning in or about September 2010, Hansmeier and Steele, using the firm Steele Hansmeier PLLC, began representing individuals and entities that owned copyrights to pornographic movies. Defendants and their agents monitored file sharing websites and obtained IP addresses of individuals who downloaded or attempted to download their clients' movies. Defendants then filed copyright infringement lawsuits against these anonymous individuals, sometimes referred to as John Doe's and sought authority from the court, often referred to as early discovery, to subpoena internet service providers for subscriber information associated with the IP addresses. After receiving the subscriber information, defendants made phone calls and sent letters to subscribers associated with the target IP addresses in which they offered to resolve the suit and refrain from publicly naming the subscriber in exchange for a settlement payment of approximately $3,000. Many of the individuals who received the defendant's letters and phone calls agreed to pay the settlement, including some of my clients. I had been hired back in 2011 and 12 before we discovered that this was, for lack of a better term, BS, that it was extortion, that it was illegal, and that they did not have the basis for the claims that they said they did. Before we figured that out, several people uh, settled cases and paid Prenda Law money. Those people, by the way, can get their money back, and they should be contacting the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Minnesota and asking for, about victims' restitution for the Prenda Law, John Steele, Paul Hansmeyer extortion scheme. Beginning no later than in or about April 2011, Hansmeyer and Steele caused PH to upload their clients' pornographic movies to BitTorrent file sharing websites, including a website named The Pirate Bay, in order to entice people to download the movies and make it easier to catch those who attempted to obtain the movies. PH is not Paul Hansmeier, as best I can tell. Um, my recollection is that I know the name of PH, and I dealt with PH back in 2012 when I first started doing these kinds of cases. And it's very interesting to find out that PH, if it's, if, I, if it's the person I think, PH was a producer of pornographic movies and was acting on behalf. Uh, Steele and Hansmeier were allegedly acting on his behalf or something. Could be a different PH. Obviously, we're given initials. Could be any PH. We have two PHs right here, Paul Hansmeier and this PH. So I could be wrong. As defendants knew, the BitTorrent websites to which they uploaded their clients' movies were specifically designed to aid copyright infringement by allowing users to share files, including movies, without paying any fees to copyright holders. Defendants obscured their involvements in the lawsuits. In or about November 2011, in order to distance themselves from the copyright lawsuits and any potential fallout, defendants caused Prenda Law to be created. Although P.D., an attorney located in Chicago, nominally owned Prenda Law, Hansmeier and Steele exerted de facto control over Prenda Law, including the primary direction of its employees and dispensation of its finances. Additionally, beginning in or about 2011, defendants created various entities that they surreptitiously controlled, including AF Holdings, Ingenuity 3 LLC, Guava LLC, and LW Systems LLC. One more time, AF Holdings, Ingenuity 13, Guava, and LW Systems were also part of the Prenda Law scheme. If you paid a settlement in one of those, you should be contacting the Minnesota Attorney General's office, uh, as, as set up here in the beginning of this thing. The, excuse me, this is the, you want to be contacting the U.S. Attorney's office for the District of Minnesota or the United States Department of Justice, Computer Crimes, and Intellectual Property section. That's who you should be contacting. If you have been a victim of one of those 
companies, Prenda, AF Holdings, Ingenuity 13, Guava, and LW Systems, you should be contacting them. Uh, they should be able to help you out with restitution. Uh, just to bookend things, not a windfall, not necessarily extra money, but your damages should definitely be able to get paid, which would be your compensation plus interest would be what I would expect you to be re to be receiving. The This agreement depends on it. So if they do not make restitution, then this agreement is invalid as to John or Paul Hansmeyer. So they should be making good on that. You may even be contacted yourself, like they might they might reach out to you and not just wait. Defendants filmed their own pornographic movies and uploaded them to file sharing websites. Beginning no later than in or about May 2012, defendants participated in filming pornographic movies on, or on at least three separate occasions in Chicago, Miami, and Las Vegas. Hansmeyer and Steele, at times assisted by PD, ML, and PH, contracted with adult film actresses and produced multiple short pornographic films. Hansmeyer and Steele then caused Ingenuity 13 to obtain copyrights to the films, which bore names like Five Fan Favorites and A Peek Behind the Scenes at the Show. Shortly after filming the movies, Hansmeyer instructed PH to upload the movies to file sharing websites such as the Pirate Bay in order to catch and file lawsuits against people who attempted to download the movies. Are you outraged yet? Defendants concealed their actions from the courts. After uploading their clients and their own pornographic movies to BitTorrent websites, Hans Meyer and Steele caused lawsuits to be filed alleging that individuals who reportedly downloaded the movies did so without authorization or consent from the copyright holder or its agents and that their client had suffered damages. After filing the initial complaint in these lawsuits, defendants then filed ex parte motions seeking to obtain early discovery regarding the identities of the subscribers associated with the IP addresses used to download the movies, and therein represented to the court that the unnamed defendants downloaded the movies without authorization. In each of these lawsuits, and the accompanying ex parte motions for early discovery, Hans Meyer and Steele concealed from the court that they uploaded the client's movies to BitTorrent websites, that they filmed their own pornographic movies, in order to upload them to BitTorrent websites that they owned and controlled the plaintiffs and thus had a significant personal stake in the litigation. Hansmeyer and Steele knew these facts were material to the court's decisions whether to permit early discovery. The courts relying on the defendants' lawsuits and motions granted early discovery and thereby authorized the defendants to subpoena internet service providers for subscriber information with the IP addresses set forth in the motions and or civil complaints. After obtaining the subscriber information associated with the IP addresses, the defendants sent letters and made phone calls to the subscribers seeking settlement payments in exchange for dismissing the lawsuits against those subscribers. Hacking Allegations Beginning in or about October 2012, Hans Meyer and Steele caused lawsuits to be filed generally or on behalf of Guava LLC, falsely alleging that certain named defendants had hacked into their computer systems. This is a Computer Fraud and Abuse Act thing. People were sued under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, alleging that they had shared passwords to a pornographic website and that that constituted hacking under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. And since hacking is a crime, and since the, criminal, the, 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 the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act made any computer crime that fell under it also civilly reachable by a civil lawsuit, now Hansmeyer and Seal could sue people for computer hacking based on these same false allegations. In fact, as the defendants knew, the defendants named in these lawsuits had been caught downloading one of Hans Meyer and Steele's clients' movies from a file-sharing website, these defendants had agreed that in exchange for Hans Meyer and Steele waiving a settlement payment, the defendant would be sued and permit Hans Meyer and Steele to seek discovery about his or her alleged co-conspirators. Hans Meyer and Steele brought several lawsuits falsely alleging that these defendants had participated in hacking Guava's computers in order to attempt to obtain authority from the court to issue subpoenas to internet service providers. Yeah, that was the other half of it. I forgot about that. They then would settle with the lead defendant by telling the lead defendant that they wanted them to admit to their crimes, and then they would have them admit to the computer hacking, therefore allowing thousands of other sometimes innocent defendants to receive 
demand letters and have their identities turned over to Hansmeier and Steele and Prenda Law based on just the one plaint the one defendant that agreed to settle their case. So they would use one lead defendant to get thousands of other defendants' information. Fraudulent losses. In total, between 2011 and 2014, defendants and their entities received more than $3 million in fraudulent proceeds from the lawsuits described above. Money laundering. In or about 2012, the defendants created a company, Under the Bridge Consulting, that they intended to, and did use, to collect consulting fees after transferring the operations of Steel Hansmeyer PLLC to PD through Prenda Law. The defendants thereafter transferred approximately $1 million of the proceeds of the fraudulent scheme to Under the Bridge Consulting and distributed those monies to Hansmeyer and Steele. The defendant's use of Under the Bridge Consulting was designed in whole or in part to conceal or disguise the nature, source, ownership, and control of the proceeds of their fraudulent scheme. The penalties for such, the 1349 violation is imprisonment up to 20 years, a fine of up to 250000 or twice the gross gain or loss, a term of supervised release of five years, a $100 special assessment, and the costs of prosecution. The 1956H violation is also a term of up to 20 years in prison, criminal fine of 500000 or twice the gross gain, a term of supervised release of up to five years, special assessment of $100, and costs. There would be a revocation of supervised release if he violates any condition of the supervised release. There are various guidelines, sentencing guidelines, that affect this. The loss was between $1.5 and $3.5 million, the base offense should be increased by 16 levels. I, I really don't know enough, and I'm not going over it right now, the whole sentencing guidelines thing, but if you wanted to go over it, that's 16 levels of increase. 10 or more victims means an increase of two levels. Uh, sophistication of the crimes means an increase of two levels. The aggravating role as leader, organizer, or manager means an increase of four levels. The defendant abused a position of trust. That means an increase of two levels. The obstruction of justice means an increase of two levels. The money laundering offense means an increase of one level for one and two levels for another. The acceptance of responsibility means a reduction in levels. Two levels reduction. There are no other applicable enhancements. The sentencing guideline range is 135 months to 168 months imprisonment. That's 10, 11, that's 11 to 14 years. Yeah, I like that. I like that. 11 to 14 years and a fine of 35 to $350,000, supervised release of two to five years, and a sentence of imprisonment not to exceed 150 months. So he is looking at 13 and a half years in jail. I'm sure that, they will, that he will serve less than that, but still a sentence of 13 and a half years in jail or something even close to that would be really acceptable to me. Discretion of the court. The parties understand that this does not bind the court. The court gets to review this and make their own d determination. And here's a very important part. Everybody, please listen up if you're a victim of this. Defendant understands and agrees that the Mandatory Restitution Act, 18 U.S.C. 3663A, applies and that the court is required to order the defendant to pay the maximum restitution to his victims as provided by law. The defendant understands and agrees that the court will order him to make restitution for the entire loss caused by his fraud scheme and that the restitution order will not be limited to the counts of conviction. That is... Very important. If you're a victim, 
please contact the U.S. Attorney's Office in Minnesota or the Department of Justice Cyber Crimes Division or whatever that was listed in the front because they really could get you your money back. Um, I don't have any losses. I represented people. We did the best we could. I got paid. You should be able to get your money back, including the amount that you paid to me, from John Steele and Paul Hansmeier. Or if you hired another attorney, you should be able to get whatever your losses were because of that scheme. You should be able to get every penny plus interest back. I don't know how easy it will be or whether you'll get it back instantaneously. I'm pretty sure that 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 these guys just don't keep the money laying around to be paid back to everybody. But somehow they will be paying it back, and uh, you should at least be able to have your chance at having him violate this agreement if he doesn't pay it back. And that means a longer jail sentence for him. So that has been prosecuted by Erica McDonald, U.S. Attorney, Benjamin Lang Langner and David McLaughlin, Assistant U.S. Attorneys, District of Minnesota, and Brian Levine, Assistant U.S. Attorney, Department of Justice, Cybercrimes. If you guys, if, if you're a victim, you need to talk to Erica McDonald's office. That's who you should be contacting. I'm not even, like, that's not even a, this isn't a legal, legal advice or anything. This is more of a fact. If you're a victim of one of these crimes, you should be contacting them because we got them. So what do you think about that, guys? Paul Hansmeier, I think John Steele pled guilty last year. Let's check that one out. This was March 9th, 2017. You can, re you can watch my video on that. So yeah, so we got him. John Steele pled guilty. Paul Hansmeier now pleads guilty. And Paul Duffy died of alcoholism and uh, an underlying then heart condition that was either caused or exacerbated by his alcoholism. This isn't, this is a real story. Like, this is a first-hand thing. I've spoken to John Steele. I've spoken to Paul Hansmeier. I've spoken to Paul Duffy. I've spoken to a second Paul Duffy when he pretended to be somebody else because he didn't want his name associated with these cases anymore. And he pretended to be a different person. Spencer or something, I forget. Um, so this was a real thing. John Steele told me to go F myself. Um... They told me that, that they wouldn't give me copies of legal documents and things that my clients needed. It was, they, they, they were definitely not acting as if they had a legitimate case. They were acting like strong arm mafia style attorneys. So this is what we refer to when we say that copyright trolls operate things like mafia style extortion schemes. I'm not even kidding. We really do. There really are copyright trolls out there who operate like mafia-style extortion schemes. And the major difference between ones that are legal and ones that are not is whether they own the copyrights that they're suing over. And if they, if they don't own the copyrights or if they've placed those copyrights into the stream of commerce for file sharing themselves, then that's not copyright infringement when you download it. How do you know you don't? So don't do that if you don't want to be subject to this kind of lawsuit or claim or risk or whatever. And, and as someone who represents people who are regularly getting hit with this kind of thing, it's not fun. It is not like you're fighting for the cause. I'm fighting for the cause. And yes, I enjoy it. It might even be a little fun. But the defendant is not enjoying getting sued by a large organization that produces adult entertainment products. There is no shame there. There is no limit there. There is no predictability there. So that's why I spent the last six years getting very familiar with these kinds of cases. Not just getting familiar. I represented a defendant in the very first case. I was on the legal team that defended five people. We were each individually responsible for our own defendants. But I was part of a legal team that tried to make these cases go away. And we did successfully make the Prenda Law cases go away. I didn't personally do it. The people in Minnesota figured that out. But 
when I when we when they figured it out, when the community figured it out, the, my colleagues and I figured it out that it was a BS charge. You bet we didn't pay John Steele or Paul Hansmeyer or, or Paul Duffy a single dime after that. And I still have the text messages that I that I probably would never reveal talking to other members of our of our copyright community that you rec- names that you might recognize from Twitter and from legal articles and things, because we were all trying to figure out what to do about Prenda law about five, six years ago. And this is what happened. They got caught. They made up the, the, they made up the videos, literally making the videos. Sometimes they made up the copyrights. They put them on pirate Bay. That's an implied license or express license. You do not have to have permission if someone puts it up for you to download because that is permission. So they put them up for, for, for distribution wholly as a honeypot just to catch IP addresses and catch easy settlements. And because that was illegitimate and because they got caught, they are in, they're going to jail. And I hope that, uh, I hope that they'll be getting longer sentences rather than shorter ones. But that's just my humble opinion. They abused a position of trust. They abused, they made even good lawyers, you know, look a little bit bad. I have to explain to every client that calls whether their case is a Prenda law case or a legitimate case. And I have to be careful about how much the defense attorney calls the plaintiff's case legitimate and says, oh, no, no, this isn't Prenda law. This is a, your case is a real one. Uh, can't exactly just go and say that. Uh, yeah, by the way, the plaintiff in your case, yeah, they're much better than Prenda Law. I can't say that. I have to find a way to say, yeah, Prenda Law did this really the wrong way. These other, these other guys, we don't agree with it, but the courts haven't thrown them out yet. I have to do stuff like that because of this. I have to literally take this into account in my day-to-day conversations with my clients. I have to account for John Steele and Paul Hansmeyer and all that because of this. So I'm proud to say that I was in the courtroom, not just in, but like I was an attorney representing in the very first Malibu media case, which was happening at the same time as these. And I've defended over 600 people and written articles and done videos and everything trying to make the public aware of these cases. Unfortunately, I think the numbers just don't work out. I can't possibly make everybody aware. And I constantly get phone calls with new clients or potential clients where people are saying, I never knew this was possible. I never knew you could get sued for, for downloading something on the internet. So that's, they, they don't give you any warning either. It's not like they send you some DMCA takedown notices and say, by the way, we sue people. You should know to stop before we sue you. That'd probably be a more ethical way to do it, but they don't do that. They just accumulate the, the, the infringements and then sue the defendant. That's what they do. So what do you think of that, lawful masses? That That's actually way closer to a bit of my life and uh, my law practice. Than, than anything else we've really done here. This is that's pretty much what I do, um, my my day job or or law firm practice is focused on defending people from these kinds of things, and since that's the case, this could be considered attorney advertising, and I want to make sure I meet my legal obligations that I am an attorney, I do take clients in these cases, and that I'm not uh, that you know, I'm not hiding any conflict of interest here. I am presenting this to you both because it's a wonderful story, but also some client might see this someday and say, hey, that Leonard French, I I saw his video. I really want to hire him as my attorney. Or they might see me in my studio and my thing and say, oh my God, I would never hire an attorney that doesn't dress in a suit and tie and have an office and all that. And that's fine. Like that's, that's, I want you to have the attorney that you feel most comfortable with. Trust me, my clients love me. And if you're not comfortable with me, you're not going to love me. I want you to be with an attorney you love. So please, hire the attorney you're comfortable with. Even if it's not me, I'm not going to feel bad. I will, I, will, I will live. I will find a way to, to make money however I have to make money. I do not need it to be on the backs of copyright infringement lawsuits that I, one, disagree with, like existing, and two, um, I don't want you to be unhappy with your attorney. You need to be super pleased with your attorney. The Lawful Master Sunday Show is a year old. So far, 
we are doing really well. And it's because of your support. It's because of our efforts. It's because of the genuine, heartfelt sincerity with which people contribute their time, effort, energy to the channel in one way or the other. Not just my staff, but also people who submit stories, talk to us, come to the stream. We wouldn't be here if you didn't come and watch the stream. So thank you very much for that. It does not seem like you're here as trolls. It seems like you're here as genuine, sincere, heartfelt people who want to see me perform, see the show, hear the news, learn about the law. This is awesome. Thank you very much. So, thank you for joining us. This is a community-supported channel. I am Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. Thank you for pledging your monthly support on patreon.com slash ljfrench. A big thank you to the following supporters at the $50 level in August. Jonathan Doe, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Evie, Andy, Kyle Mudrock, John H. Anderson, Vera Mentane, Sean McNamara, William Gonzalez, Michael Pierce, Terry Crisp, Grunkle Tia Marie, and Michael Jones. And thank you to the $5 plus supporters that are scrolling on the LED panel behind me, and I will put something up on the crawl for you as well. So this week we're going to release a number of stories that we just talked about this morning. We will talk about the Senate press resolution. We'll talk about the, the judge that threatened to make the lawyers kiss. We'll talk about Stan Lee, the manslaughter case in the Stand Your Ground Florida shooting, the bridge pusher, and the Prendel Law thing. Look for those stories either to drop as VODs or you can come back to this one on Twitch and check out the timestamps. We'll see if we can put those in the timestamps for you. Thank you very much, everyone. I am Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. Thank you and have a great week. Let's everybody have a sip. Say hi to Kato. Go Kato. Good, you'll suck. She doesn't know what to do. She's so happy. Oh, we've got a toy. I know, we can't throw the ball. I know who you are. Are you scared? What's the big ball? Hello, my kiddo boy. Hello, my kiddo. Hi. 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 Yes. <laughs>